All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM, joining you from sunny San Diego. And today I'm joined by, from, I presume, a sunny Sedona, Arizona, from, with uh, Damien Lupa. How are you doing? Hey, it's good, good to be here, John. And yes, it is sunny in Sedona. <laughs> And uh, and Damien is basically he is he's a, he's the founder of Yukido, a martial art, um, but he's also a financial mentor and host of Financial Underdogs podcast and the creator of Black Belt Wealth, best-selling author in personal finance. And so, okay, uh, Damien, your your goal has been to help, as you say, help Main Street learn how to to maximize their finances and. Uh, not so much follow the Wall Street model and all of that. So uh, today, like, there's a lot of people probably are waking up for the first time, given that we're in this crisis. They're looking at their 401ks. They're looking at all the traditional ways that they invest, and they're saying, ouch, this is, uh, this is pretty bad. And it tends to take, let's face it, when it comes to those kind of investments, it tends to take a crisis for us to really pay attention to them. So hopefully you can give some advice today on how how should people start looking at their finances and maybe are there some advice you could give them about opportunities to do things a little differently going forward. Absolutely. I think one of the things that is becoming very obvious is the lack of control that we have. Mm-hmm. We, we've, we, we're on this roller coaster and what people have been used to is this thing that constantly goes up. And it's like, oh, it's very gentle and it's consistent. We've had a bull market for 10 years. And so most people's money and their retirement money is is in a stock market that they have absolutely no control on and quite frankly, don't know hardly anything about. Mm-hmm. And just because you read the Wall Street Journal doesn't really mean that you know a lot about it. What's, what's happening is we're realizing more and more that we're being harvested by the system. And it's giving us a chance to do a lot of really good things. Like a pandemic for me is an opportunity for us to take a deep look and to be still long enough to actually pay attention. Because what we tend to be doing, there's a great book called Power Versus Force that um, I think is fantastic to understand this concept. We've been forcing a lot of stuff, whether it's forcing our careers, forcing our investments, forcing our relationships. And now we're sitting still and looking and we're taking the tension out of it by being still and we're seeing all sorts of stuff that wasn't we weren't aware of because we, we the tension creates it, this tunnel focus. And so mm-hmm. all we see is this one thing in front of us while sitting still because we're quarantined. We're, we're now going, oh, look at all these things. Maybe there's a different world. So what is this forcing us or what is this giving us an opportunity for? Actually understanding what's important and being able to say, okay, I actually want to control my investments and my financial future. Instead of having a life by default, it's giving us a chance to say, I want a life by design. And mm-hmm. what can I do? Well, first off, it's really just taking responsibility. And it seems like a simple idea, but the truth <laughs> is we're very good victims. The market oh, did this, yes. Congress did that, the, whoever. <laughs> and, and we have an opportunity now to say, okay, if it's going to be, it's up to me. So what am I going to do? Who am I going to be? And, and that's, that's an amazing opportunity because we're sort of forced into that place right now to think about it because we have a lot of time on our hands. Yeah, I'm, I I love that point you make there because it's uh, it's one dear to my heart as well. Is like there's such an amazing, and I try to tell people this, there's such an amazing sense of freedom when you take personal accountability for your life. And it doesn't, and yes, it's not an easy thing to do because you have to go through some self-awareness. But the liberating thing is you go, yes, the situation I'm in today, yeah, it's all my fault. You know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, it's all my fault. And therefore, I have the I have the power to do something about it. And the things that I don't have power over, well, forget them. There's nothing I can do about them anyway. But But I think it's such a liberating thing. And I think it's unfortunate. Maybe sometimes it takes a lot of us uh, a long time before we reach that point. Well, we're trained. We're trained to, mm-hmm. to point fingers and we're trained to be perfect instead of making mistakes. Mistakes tend to be painful because we, there's judgment that we're trained for. And, and it's like you, with our martial arts background, we, mm-hmm. we realize that the value in mistakes is that that's how we grow. And yeah. the true wealth is in going through experiences. I was I'm teaching with Robert Kiyosaki, the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Right. We were chatting and, and this is last year. And he said, wealth is, is the, the growth that you have from doing the thing. It's not about cash or cash flow or how big your mutual fund is. And mm-hmm. that's the problem with a lot of these investments, people don't actually have any experience. So it goes up, it goes down, you still don't have any experience and you haven't grown. So what can we do to grow? And if we learn how to grow and embrace the mistake, 
we realize the power in that. And, and it really is the thing that sets us free. And how much of it comes down in your experience, Damien, to the fact that most people, and, and, we, and I'd, be, I'd say I'd be guilty of this myself at times, is that you don't really have an idea of what your goal is. Your goal is right uh, in terms, you know, and say in financial goals, you know, you sort of go, well, build up my 401k and earn money so I can do stuff. But beyond that, haven't really thought it through. And I think that's a lot of people are probably waking up now realizing that they have never thought about, they don't have a financial plan. They don't even have financial goals. Well, one of the biggest problems that we have is we don't actually figure out how much life costs. We just say, mm -hmm. okay, well, I'm spending whatever I'm making and I'm building this thing up and I hope it's enough that I'm, I'm going to survive. And that's the strategy. And instead, the, a rational way to do it, which is it takes some time, and it, but it's really powerful is to say, okay, my vision of my life is X. And so what does X cost? And it costs a certain amount per month. It costs a certain amount up front. And when we get clear on that, then we go, okay, well then, you know, I need to, I need to create $25,000 a month cash flow. So I'm going to have to learn and grow into that space of creating that, those assets. The bigger picture beyond that though, if we, if we want to look there is, is that we, we have to be willing to go do something that's almost beyond our lifetime. And, and I, I heard this and it made sense, resonated when Ted Turner was talking about his father, that his father hit his goals and then he died because he basically was done. And so there's mm -hmm. a part of us that I think needs to be really cognizant and thoughtful of what is this vision of creating something and let the money be an offset. If we say, I'm going to go after money, then we become these little money bees instead of honey bees. And in nature, right. bees go do honey and they cross pollinate everything. So our true purpose is maybe an offshoot at 90 degrees and it's not money. And what people do is they get obsessed about money and they screw everything up because they're not on purpose. So figuring out that purpose and doing something that matters to the world. And it's not altruistic. It's not about passion. Yeah. And it's about, it's about purpose. Like, why are we here? And it's not just to correct, collect a bunch of money. I've done that five, 10, $20 million. And it, it wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. So I think we need to be careful about making that the entire focus of our lives. Yeah, and no, I think that's a I think that's an excellent point. And I think we, when you say um, also when you say purpose, and and sometimes people misinterpret that, and they think you have to have, as you said, some grand purpose, right? Some grand altruistic purpose that you're going to make this massive impact in the world. And good, maybe you are. Good luck to you. But a lot of the times, it's it's purpose. Maybe it's in the simple things. Maybe it's about being the best parent, being the best person in the community, being the best partner to your significant other, whatever it is. Uh, or just, you know, building something meaningful that's small and contained, but it's just as powerful, right? That, that, I, I couldn't say it better. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating because I think that there's incredible value and there's a lot of fulfillment by coming up with a plan for deep impact on a billion people. And there's also, mm -hmm. I think, could be as equal of an impact on yourself in the fulfillment space by, by being a great father, a great spouse. Mm -hmm. Like there's... There's power in these things and it, the, the overriding, the, the thread that is fed, you know, that goes between these is that it's not about you. It's, it's yeah. about somebody else. And when we do that, it opens something up where we move from being a hedonistic, well, like me, I, I felt like I was a hedonistic prick because it was all about my own <laughs> consumption to moving into a space about where there's contribution and things calm down in a really magical way. It's a much better existence in my opinion. Yeah, and I think that's the and and as we talked about it, both being being martial artists, I think that's one of the great things about martial art, particularly when you do, when you do martial arts as an adult. If you keep studying, because you are you're the eternal student, and there's always somebody. It doesn't matter what degree you are. There's a there's a grandmaster who's a bunch of degrees above you, or has been doing it since like before they were born, and they're now ninety. When they have that amount of wisdom, so you're you're always you're always in a position of humility and learning, and and I think that's a that's I think if you brought that into the rest of your life, uh, that's a good place to start. That, that's probably the strongest thing that I've ever seen from somebody in terms of uh, martial arts and in business. There was there's this level of humility that defines somebody as someone with great power, and it's it's mm -hmm. the people that project this this ego where I see a lot of force and I don't see a lot of power. And so I, it's always fascinating to watch and see the person that has to prove something. And I go, okay, I'm not really that concerned about that. It's like somebody looking for a fight. Not really that concerned about that person. It's <laughs> it's the person that's just really humble and calm. And it's like, okay, they're they're 
they're kind of there and you don't want to wake that up or, or do the wrong thing because <laughs> that's what you have to worry about. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was found it was always I was found it quite liberating myself in many ways that uh, was when I was living on the East Coast and I, I was CEO of a couple of companies. And then in the evening, like I go down to the Dojang and I was just a student. Yeah. And it was great because now I was just a student learning and and, you know, a different environment. But I mean, it's it was great to have that as you have behind you. It's great to have that, you know, yin, yin and yang piece, you know, coming together. Yeah, there's 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 something about always being a student. And one of the things that uh, that I, I was having a conversation with uh, a friend of mine that I wrote a book with called Reinvented Life, where one of his points and I adapted or adopted this was that he always wanted to make sure he was he had someone that was beyond him in their their experience and wisdom that was mm -hmm. a mentor. He wanted to have peers that were in a similar space, and he always wanted to have students that he could teach and and impart his wisdom and his, his experiences. And so I I love that. And sometimes people feel like, oh well, you know, I I'm at a point where I'm too old to learn new things or or to be a student. And I think, wow, you've really missed out on the on the, the trifecta yeah. of being a human. So I, I, yeah. I like being a student. Being it's powerful. I mean, learning something new. I mean, because in many ways, it's it's reinvigorating. As the older you get, the more you you put yourself out there to learn new things. It's it's very re, it's reinvigorating. You know? because you're starting starting to learn something new. And yeah, it takes, again, come back, to, it takes a little humility because as adults, we don't like to not know things. We don't like to be an expert, not straight out of the gate. We like to come in. We don't like to be a student. And it's funny when you push that aside, it's very, it, it's a great experience. But I think coming back to the essence of what we're talking about here, I think in terms of um, financial freedom, it does, the essence of this does come back, as you said, to knowing what it is that you want out of life and then figuring out how to fund that, as opposed to figuring out how to fund everything before you even know what you're funding. Well, and sometimes it's, I mean, it's a great point. The, the one of the things that I, I remember years ago, I decided it would, I really wanted a Ferrari. So I went out and bought a Ferrari. Mm -hmm. What I wanted was the experience of the Ferrari. My ego wanted to go <laughs> own a Ferrari because I needed to prove something. Right. And what I've realized is, and this is true for pretty much everybody, there's an experience that we want. And it's not necessarily that we want to own something. That, that's more of an ego. And it, it, it doesn't necessarily take 20 or 30 years to have the experience. It could take five minutes to go book <laughs> renting that experience. And that's, that's for a lot of these things. But we waste decades thinking about how many things we're going to own and control. And it's like, well, what do you really want here? What's the deep driver behind the ego? What is that? And mm -hmm. it's, you, you want to have the experience. You want to share the experience. And it's a lot simpler than we think if we actually boil down what the, 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 the desire is. And it's funny you say that because, uh, I mean, I, I've seen in the past, you know, that used to be a great thing that sales managers would do is they'd go to the salesperson and say, you know, what do you want? Do you want to get a boat? Do you want to like a Ferrari? In your case, a Ferrari. Okay, put the picture of the Ferrari up there on your desk and just look at that Ferrari every day and drive yourself forward. Just fine. But as you, as you say, at the end of the day, is that really the goal? Um, it's something. It's something else. Maybe that is a manifestation of it in some ways, but it's something else that if you were pushing towards the overarching goal, uh, it'd be healthier and probably faster. That's right, hundred <laughs> percent. Um, so, so now that people are having this forced upon them stillness and a little bit of time to themselves, hopefully a little bit of, of space to think, um, would you, how would you advise people in order to take a good look at their life and to start to figure out how their finances play into it? What would be a good framework to do that within? Well, I think the first thing it really truly is, is to look out and say, okay, what the, whatever I'm building, whatever trajectory I'm on, if we look backwards, say a year and, and, and say, so let's say 2019, December, 2019, and go back to the January 1st, 2019, that trajectory in all likelihood is going to continue along minus the markets doing what they've done, but you're like what you're generally doing. And so the question is in 10 or 20 years, where are you going to likely be? Cause we're, we're likely on the same trajectory. We don't tend to move off of it unless there's a huge amount of effort. So the question is, where are you heading? And, and then is that where you want to be? And if it's not, then the question is, what do you need to do different? And, and this is where you have to get around different people. Because if we're mm -hmm. around the same echo chamber, whether it's on Facebook or our neighborhood or whatever, we're going to hear the same things. We're going to stay the same person because we're going to, we're going to absorb the energy around people and those conversations. And so nothing's really going to change. It's very, very painful sometimes to, 
move away from certain people or to cut certain relationships. Yeah. And the truth is that's how we grow. We we're around people. Great story with, with, um, Mark Victor Hansen was, was with Tony Robbins years ago. And he said, Hey, I want to know how you've hit 400 million, whatever his number was. And Tony said, what do you mean? He said, well, I, I'm in a mastermind and I've got people there. And Tony said, okay, you got a mastermind. And so what are, who's in there? And he goes with well, a bunch of millionaires. Tony said, that's your problem. You don't have any billionaires in there. And they, they think differently. And so the question is, who's in your mastermind? And you, you go, well, I don't have a mastermind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do. It's all the people that you're talking to. And so who, who are you absorbing? And I think the, the simplest thing, if you want to change things right now for, the, for your future, is to assess who is influencing you. And some of those people might need to be reduced or eliminated. And it'll change everything because you'll naturally start shifting who you are. So be really careful about their wealth, about their health, about their integrity. All of it's going to absorb into your being and you'll become that. So be mindful of it and you'll be amazed at what happens almost automatically. Yeah, and I think that's a great piece of advice to to end on. And I think it's it's fundamental. And as you say, it's it's difficult because it's very easy to stay surrounded by people who make you comfortable. And I don't mean comfortable in a in a is a good comfortable, but just comfortable in a way that you means you don't have to ever really move outside of you know, stretch yourself or do anything. And it's also, and let's face it, the other thing is misery loves company too. So if you're miserable, you're gonna find a bunch of miserable people to hang around with. Uh uh, who aren't going to turn around and say to you, stop being miserable, they're going to uh, commiserate with you. Um, but I think that is the hardest thing. And I think that's a difficult thing is, especially because we live in this strange world now of this artificial like social media where everybody is judged by how many you know, friends and followers and all of this they have. So it, more and more is more seems to be the mantra. But at the end of the day, certainly in my experience is that if you start to reduce the circle around you to, to meaningful people, your life gets better with every reduction almost. That, that there's, there's almost nothing that's more important right now because we've, we've tended to go in the wrong direction. We're, mm -hmm. we're taking on the energy and all these things, these, the meaning behind how many likes or friends we have. And the, the, the idea of friends on a digital platform is a joke. The question <laughs> is who matters and, and you know, the, the close ones to you. And what are you putting into the relationships and how are you circulating mm -hmm. with those? It's so much different and so much more important. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, listen, Damien, this has been great. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, me today. All of Damien's information will be in his contributor bio. But before we go, please do tell people a bit more about yourself and what you do. Well, I mean, we basically what what I do is is I, I help people with financial literacy, and and I do that with retirement money, um, with something called an EQRP, helping you get control of your money, and I help with a lot of the teaching that I do around understanding how to deal with your money, how to create it, how to keep it, uh, keeping it, and and creating it are vastly different, and so there's just a there's a lot of work that has to be done. I will tell you if you want to know what to invest in right now, I'll give you the one tip, and that is you. You're the best investment you'll ever make. And it's not about people say, well, should I invest in stocks or real estate? And I go, no, you, 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 your personal development is where you should invest your money. And if you're not doing that, if you don't have an R and D budget on yourself, then you're making a mistake and you can fix that today. And then you can start investing in the thing that will give you the greatest returns the rest of your life. Invest in yourself. Yeah, I love it. That's fantastic. I love R&D budget for yourself. And if you do decide to do that and you say to one of your friends that you're doing that and they tell you that that's a stupid idea, well, then you've just achieved two things. Number one, you start your R&D and second off, you get rid of that friend. That's it. <laughs> Straightforward. Lots of awesome feedback right there. <laughs> All right. Listen, thanks a lot. This is John Golden, SalesPop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline or CRM. See you for another expert interview really soon. Yeah.